TB Nation is now sponsoring the nation's leading online tournament series for bass fishing. We have tournament trails popping up all over the country and are currently looking for directors to lead new trails. Check us out, tbnationhp.com. Hey guys, what's going on? So I was fishing the other day, throwing on the shores, there were seagulls everywhere, there were some boils here and there, and lo and behold, right next to me, a dead, perfect-sized gizzard shad was just floating on the surface, and it was an anomaly. I mean, there were, I'm, I'm so happy it didn't get picked up by like a seagull or another fish. Like it just floated by my boat. I immediately picked it up, looked at it, sized it up, and it wasn't in the greatest condition. It had been chewed on because it was dead, but it was good enough condition that we were able to mold it and then reconstruct it and then make our own lures with a perfect gizzard shad body along with some retrofitted things that really make it kind of our own bait. Stay tuned and check out the whole thing starting now. All right, here it is. It's not doing so hot and we need to um, mold this thing now. So I know it won't be a perfect mold, but what we can lightly mold over and we'll pour a few castings to get one right in there. Casting the bait and then remodifying and shaping it to, to get trimmed is, is a little bit easier. But I know this thing's got no time. Hobby Lobby's closed on Sundays. So the only plan B that I have is this stuff. We bought a crap ton of this stuff. Number one silicone. You need a bowl that you can mix in perfectly a glass bowl, but you need Dawn soap, you need water. You need this so specifically because it's the slimiest and the most suited to do this. I'm gonna go ahead and spray it with mold release because I've never actually applied silicone to a live body, so I don't really know. away and again the only reason this works is because 30 or so squeezes so you know like most of it's been exposed you just kind of just want to mess it the whole thing is just like once it's exposed to the water it activates so the minute you want to get as, as most as much of it exposed to water through squishing it and moving it around and pushing it in the water to ensure that all of it dries evenly you don't want one spot to dry in 30 minutes and then some spots are going to take another seven days to dry or not dry at all because there's no exposure the whole catalyst and the silicone drying at all is not air it's water it's pretty much ready we're looking for the non-clear at this point we don't want any clear i'm going to try this whole i'm going to do only do half the fish because I've tried this before with not the most success. Although it was useful, but it wasn't anything great. We really lucked out when this body kind of, you know, when it was decomposing and stiffening up, it like stiffened completely straight. Like we got super lucky, the fish was just completely straight and rigid and um, took its natural shape as it would be if it was just stagnant and staying there. It was like the perfect mold, perfect size. Eight is like a nine inch, just a nine inch fish, little bait fish. I mean, I've been looking for one that size. You can't get one. It's hard enough just to even get a full grown one that you can actually see and snag, like, or catch. Like, they're super hard to catch. Unless you're like, I guess, netting for them. I don't know how to net for anything. So, now that this is on here, we're just gonna go ahead and let this dry. I mean, really, that's all we have left is to let it dry. You can tell it's almost forming now because it doesn't want to stick to itself. The reason you want clear silicone instead of white silicone, the white silicone will work, but you can't tell when it activates. Like the clear silicone will turn white. It'll start turning white once it's ready. And then, so you need to know when it's ready. Like that's the whole, the whole reason. That's the only reason, like right now it's ready. Right now, if I kept squeezing that thinking, then right now, see it's pliable. And this is when you would actually mold it to whatever you're molding. Right now, of course, we're just trying to strengthen and build up the side. So that's all we're doing. This took three tubes to clear one side. So I'd say six tubes would do okay for this in terms of what we're trying to accomplish here. Let's see what we got here. We have a partially molded fish. Since I don't ever do this and there's always a questionable spot, I don't like doing two piece mold. They take too long. I always do a one piece mold and, but there's also consequences that come with that. Um, one of those is just not ever knowing where the middle is. And we're gonna go ahead and fix that. Normally we have it made where the bait is just suspending inside of a foam board box. 
in wire like this and then we just pour around it it's really easy to cut down the middle but this time it's going to be all lumpy and imperfect and unless we put pins to mark where we need to draw our lines to cut we will never ever get it straight well and it, the consequences are pretty huge because it's live bait so when you cut into it with a knife you're going to cut it up and it's not like we can remold this again it's like one chance to get this right or we're screwed it'll be a cold day in hell before a perfectly molded body dead gizzard shad flows by my boat again i've been out here for almost seven years first time it ever happened true story The bad thing about this process is there'll be a tons of distortions and imperfections inside the mold itself. But the really good thing is it cures in about 30 minutes completely. So you can at least start working with it right away. I'd only use this situation when it's dire and it's about as dire as it gets. So let's see what we came up with. So these actually got an incredible amount of detail in them. I don't know if you can see that, if the camera can even get it, but yeah, there's a lot of air bubbles and whatever and stuff, but I can clean that up. I can carve out a legit master mold out of this. Like it's no big deal. I mean, I can even go so far as just to pour one side at a time. Just elevate this side. Okay, so what we're doing here is we have this casting resin. I think it's it's called Model Pro. I get it on eBay. I know there's better stuff out there. There's a million resins that people use. There's so many you got to keep up on. Just use whatever works for you. I've been using this stuff for a long time. And at its most liquid base with no distortions, no inhibitors, it's going to get the most detail. So we go ahead and pour it in raw. It's gonna be harder to carve though, but we want all the detail and we already know this mold's kind of jacked. It, you know, th this method is not gonna get you the greatest detail. It's gonna get you a lot of distortions. It's good for like one single, I have no other uh, like choice but to use mold. Then we pour the other side, the other side cured. And since the other side cured and this side is about to cure, you got like a 20 second work time. I had the bright idea to stick the dry side on top of the non-cured side to try and mold them together. And uh, it just seemed like it was gonna be the better fit. Otherwise I was gonna have to sand them both down and then glue them together. And that probably could have worked too. That was what I was gonna do, but hey, why mess up a good opportunity like this? Okay, so it all came out pretty bad, but one side came out all right with a fair amount of detail and the other side went completely horrible i think the face imploded on the other side it was like sunken in so normally when i make these baits it's only on an extreme rare occasion that i pour pure plastic resin with no uh density distortions into it generally i pour micro balloons which distorts the density and makes it buoyant that way i can weight it right and it'll actually swim but the other thing it does is it makes it much easier to modify if you need to do anything. It makes the resin much softer because it's not pure resin. And I should have done that. Now thinking back, I wanted all the detail, but really it was a serious amount of fail. I probably would have got the same amount of detail and would have been way easier to carve um, a much better master mold. But here I am picking away with an X-Acto knife and then maybe a little bit of 220 grit sandpaper. And we're going to have to work this thing. There was a lot of air bubbles, a lot of distortions. I knew this was going to happen. I knew it wasn't going to be perfect when I used that, you know, that silicone from the hardware store. It is what it is. But what we did get was quite a bit of good detail in the midst of all the chaos that we can now retrace with some wood chisels and some whatever and do our best. And whatever we can't get, we can remold with clay because we have pretty good documentation and pictures and some other things of the fish before it completely went down the tubes and uh, back into the freezer. So if you're wondering how we're gonna reconstruct the face and all the detail and everything, we're gonna do it with Sculpey clay. Really what we needed that fish for was the body and as much detail as we could possibly get. That way we could, you know, re-sculpt it and retrofit it and we got that we got just enough we were super lucky and the rest of it we can just carefully carefully push in sculpey clay 
And this is how we are just on the spot heating it up. Normally you'd have to put it in the oven at 275 and let it cook for 30 minutes and let it sit and blah. And I really don't know how that's how well that's gonna work on top of, a, of on top of plastic that it's not even meant to stick to. So what we are gonna do is for the moment sculpt in, put plates, obviously flip back and forth and look at it very tediously. That way we can replicate to the best of our ability the imploded side and fix it, which is what we're doing here. It's gonna take a lot of clay. And then we're gonna hit it with a heat gun hit it with a heat gun and that will kind of, you know, harden the top without completely hardening the somewhat adhesive, you know, and flexible bottom. That way the sculpt doesn't just fall off the resin. Normally I do this and I do this a lot. This technique works across the board, but generally it's on another sculpty body. I like to hard body sculpties, like I hard body this, this, this body here, but just with sculpty. And then I'll, and then sometimes I'll layer it like this. Actually, a lot of times I'll layer it like this. I'll layer entire rings of scales on it and where it's really super easy and it takes way less time to carve out something. This will take a lot of time because we're going to truly have to carve it once we fixed this uh, bulk mold template enough to where it's usable to mold again with some actual good uh, silicone. Once the Sculpey is hard on the outside from the heat gun, you can slightly cover away parts of it. We really can't do a whole lot or the Sculpey is just gonna fall off the body. Trust me, I didn't show you that part, but it happened. Really, I figured this is my only chance. I've lived here seven years. I fished this lake fairly religiously. And this is the first time I've ever seen a small gizzard shad, ever. Generally, they're huge. They're like carp. They're like by the time you find them, they're too big to do anything. I tried to carve some scales into it, but carving scales into a body that hard was super fail. I should have just left it alone, but it's too late. Really, what I need the scales for is because it holds the paint and it holds the resin better, um, and it keeps it from coming off when it gets thrashed by fish or it hits against a rock or a dock. It's better. Right now, we are using foam board. I got this up for five bucks at Hobby Lobby. It's all I use. Really, it's that and it's super glue. And I form a box. I stick the bait in it and then I'm able to suspend the bait inside of it with baling wire and then I just pour around the bait. Generally I get the mold from Hobby Lobby because I'm too lazy and too cheap to order in bulk from online store but given the recent quality of the Hobby Lobby uh, Aluminite high strength stuff not being consistent and curing too fast I would tell you just to get it straight from the factory whether it be Aluminite, Smooth on whatever like quality control with things recently have not been great. I will say that officially but if you're wondering how we suspended it, we spend it like we do with all the other baits, just like this. We have it as straight as we can. That way, when we go to cut it, we can reasonably cut it out right on the top with uh, minimal distortions to the whole body. This is a Lumilite High Strength 3 silicone mold. I really like it because it's perfect for one piece molds. So it's perfect for what we're doing here normally. Right now, it's doing me a little dirty. It's curing too fast. And again, with the quality control issue at Hobby Lobby, if you're going to get this stuff, just straight up get it from the factory itself because they'll back it more and it'll probably be fresher and you won't have problems like this. All those little chunks are chunks of recycled silicone I had from baits that I I casted and molded once and I figured they, they swim like crap so we, you can actually recycle uh, the silicone. Look at that. That is really, that shouldn't happen for like 12 hours and that happened in uh, less than a minute. So this stuff's garbage. If this one isn't good, then we are completely screwed. Thank heaven, it was good. That's how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to pour like syrup, and it's supposed to stay the consistency of syrup and for like a while. That way it kind of gets into the nooks and crannies. So we have just enough, and it gets just around the bait enough to get around all the gaps and holes and bubbles that were caused by the way, way too fast hardening stuff. I want to make it extremely clear that this is not a dig at Illuminlight because even though I knew this stuff could potentially be bad, I still went and got it because when it does what it does, it is magic. I thought I was actually gonna get away with just two of these kits, but it seems it's gonna, I'm gonna need a little bit more. So I'm gonna have to just hit up Hobby Lobby and again, and even if I get a botched kit, it won't matter because most of it's covered up and all it has to do is just get between the nooks and crannies of all that um, extra stuff. We go ahead and we let it cure for a week. I go and I go in a filmmaking venture for a boxing journey. Uh, with my son, and we come back to finish this thing. Okay, I 
it came out pretty seamlessly. A lot of times that stuff after being in there and after you're trying to force the, it out, the Sculpey starts to break off the main mold. And I put a lot of it on the face and I reconstructed the tail completely with the Sculpey. And so you gotta check in there for a little bit, see if there's any extra in there. Always use mold release. No matter what it's from, mold release will extend the life of your mold exponentially. If you don't do that, every time you pour a mold, um, parts of the plastic from the bait will just pull pieces of the silicone out over time and your detail will be less and less and less and you'll have more distortions, etc, etc. But anyways, here we're going to go ahead and wait it. I'm going to try and wait this the way I've waited my other baits in the past and we'll see if we can get this. I'm, I'm guessing this is going to take around eight to nine ounces. It's weird. I kind of do the, the whole thing everybody else does is kind of make a, a standard shad mold that's not really based toward looking great, but like more or less swimming well. And then we don't do all this weird stuff, this gullet thing that the gizzards have. Hey, why well, they call them gizzards. But we, I just don't know, this is like an extra wide body with a head. So I don't know if we would actually need more weight up front. I worry a little bit that I'm putting not enough. But we'll find out almost immediately once we pour. I'm cutting little bleed hole notches triangular notches along the foam because if I don't do this air will get in there for sure so we are going to distort this mold with micro balloons this time when we cast it it will not be pure resin the micro balloons allows you to have a distortion of density to make the bait lighter than his actual mass so you to pour pure resin in there and it would have just sank like a rock. This time it'll be buoyant. It's the closest that you can replicate to say a wooden swim bait, which is naturally buoyant. You have to load it with tons of lead for it to even sink, which makes it actually swim better because the more buoyant the bait is, the better it's gonna do its job to resist rolling. But you also would be a serious pain to try and carve a wooden swim bait that was gonna do like this and then have to do it again and again and again. So replicating a bait is really seriously worth it if you can measure out the density distortion and weight it correctly. So here we go. And also bailing wire is useful for pretty much everything, including not having to use rubber bands to hold them all together while it cures. And this stuff, I've heard some other people have like two, three hour demold time. How terrible, this stuff demolds in 15 to 20 minutes. have here so far is a obviously the mold itself isn't perfect because you know how we we got down and dirty to replicate the gizzard shed body what we have is a fairly undistorted bot. that's actually pretty darn good i can work with this i kind of regret now doing all those scales i do and i don't i mean i crap i know i'm gonna test to see what if this floats or not this is really light it's extremely light I like getting it right at the at the right demold time because if you get it right at the demold time, the the excess stuff just flakes up. I like doing only the top cut and the barely the top cut because the top is all you have to clean up. You know, see all the bottom is perfect. It's just perfect. You don't have to clean up anything on the bottom. Very excited about this. The screw eye is gonna go right in the mouth, right in there. This is where the screw eye is gonna go. It's gonna be eating the mouth. It's gonna the mouth's gonna be eating the screw eye. All right, once you you mold it. Things back on, so make sure the mold doesn't sit odd and then do something odd. Make sure there's just enough amount of tension on it to be on it, but not enough to like press against it. We just want it to be closed and normal and stay this way. You don't want it to be sagging open because later if it's set, we have had it to where I didn't do this and later on the mold was like not great. It was weird, it was off. All right, that just molded a spot for the tail. Just wanted to see. Now, I guess I also wanted that to be a little accurate because that's what it's actually gonna weigh. I don't want any more to be back there. That's gonna distort the actual weight of when we do the water test. Here it goes. It's bait. So this is how you would tell is if it, if it were balanced. You would move the weights up or down or whatever. You would drop it in. And right now it is Slightly feathering the front, that's which is good because later on when we put a tail back there, it's not going to do that. So this, all right, let's try it now. Put a tail on it. So sink it down more of the head, and I think even because this really should have been right here. Historically, the best place for me when I would do these baits to 
so the best place to put the actual uh, screw eye for the hook is the same place the weight should probably be. So these are gonna show, you can see the weights right here. They probably should have been up a little bit. Actually, I think the weights being right there are perfect. This one should have been back. This was back about an inch, probably be more balanced. If I move back an inch and it doesn't need more balance, I need to add like a little minor weight somewhere up here in the tail. But what I'm really interested to see is if the, if the, the weight ratio, whether though the weights are not set correctly from back and forth, um, it does seem to be balanced okay in terms of it's almost right where it needs to be to where it would slow sink or suspend. So we're gonna put hooks and split rings and screw eyes in it and see what that does to it. Spoiler alert, didn't wanna do this, but it'll make no sense if I don't tell you. I made these when I did the remold, the reconstruction. I made these fat little spots here on the body because clearly the gizzard shad body is too thin to actually drill a screw eye hole or any hole through. So we, I made those and molded them on with clay. That way when we came out in the mask mold to be one solid piece that I could actually have a screwable place to mount the eye into. And historically, you can actually change, you can fine tune the weight more with the size of the screw eye, though it's like super minute, which you can fine tune. But say if we wanna put a bigger one back here and a smaller one up front, and no, the fish won't rip these out. I've never had a fish rip out of a split ring. I mean, I'm sorry, a screw eye, never. I've heard that for a day, the muskie's gonna rip them out. We put that to the task. You know, a striper, big bat, and a, a fish big enough will just rip these screw eyes right out of the bait, no. We're gonna go completely honest. The only reason I go through all this trouble to make these things is to catch big fish that will put everything, all your gear to the test. And mainly also because it's a really huge pain to get like high quality baits from garage bait makers. They're a pain they has to work with. They only make some bait seasonally. You have to be right there at the moment or they get sold out. So why deal all that when you could just do it yourself? But back to the case in point. I would say that's butter crap, butter horse manure. I mean, maybe in a wooden bait because the wood's not gonna hold these as tight as plastic will, I mean, this resin will. So maybe in a wood bait, these would rip right out. I don't know. I think, you know, wood organically does its thing over time and is not made to last forever. Um, but plastic does a pretty good damn job of lasting forever as long as you don't leave it out in the sunlight. So that one's in. And if we really wanted to get super, super anal, we could have concave that with a drill bit or a, a deburring bit and made them sink in more. Screwing these in, they, you hear them to start to squeak. If they get too, if they start to get even a little bit, like you squeak and you and you feel that just that head just flex even a little bit, stop. Just stop, take it out, redrill, and then at your own risk, put another one because these will break off and ruin your bait so fast. And then we just happen to have two. Well, no, you know what we're gonna do is we are going to just get hooks that I think would be about the right size, and then just okay, we we'll get some split rings. We'll probably end up not using split rings in just the hook, and we probably be, we'll probably end up kevlaring and resining these hooks. Let's see what that does if it sinks. Ooh. No, but it almost did. We're gonna turn this into a crank down three jointed swim bait. That's what we're gonna do. Because it almost wants to sink, but it is just barely floating, and that is honestly a perfect crank down swim bait that will suspend. So that tells me is that, well, we need more weight. So we might have just needed more weight in the back to begin with. Maybe the weight placement I have is good, plus we put a 1 8 back there. You gotta be very conscious that the more weight you put as the bait, as the bait slenders and runs out of actual mass, uh, the lower weight you have to go down. You can't put, because those are half ounce weights in between, the, the 1 2 middle, those are half ounce, then there's 1 4 ounce. Back there would have to be either 1 4 or 1 8, but really because obviously there's way less mass bass there, back there, and there is in the front, probably be one eight. All right, so what we are going to do here is see where we're gonna paint or cut it. So probably down the middle, because I did kind of plan to cut it down the middle. All right, stupid, need a pencil. That's right. Okay, I cut it in half, and it's what I did. I mean, it's such a long bait. But it's about time, first for anything. First for molding a dead fish, first for molding a, whatever this is, so that's gonna go like that. Dude, that is a really long bait. That is like darn near almost a foot. And I have these long stainless steel screw eyes, and I don't know why, what these serve. I bought them because like they were there, and I was just experimenting. I've had these forever, and I really would like to get rid of them. But I really would like to join these, especially between the two pieces that actually are holding the hook and the fish together. 
The other two, we can be a little looser, use shorter ones, even smaller ones. And definitely toward the back, we're gonna have to absolutely use smaller ones, or I just, we're gonna have to. <laughs> we're just using something this big on something that small with that little diameter is not a great idea. It's not something we normally do. So we are using five screw eyes total, two large and three medium. And we will be symmetrically putting them here, actually not symmetrically because the bottom tapers into a triangle so thin. There's not a whole lot of usable mass for you to have. So they gotta be kind of shrinking as they go on. They have to be placed a little higher. I don't know what that's gonna do to the bait, but it's really the only option. We're gonna be marking these in with Dremels. And how we would do this, really, it's very hard to mold stuff like this. So I, I just go in there with a Dremel bit and I mark my spots and I go in there with a rounded beveling bit and I go in there and I hone out little concave areas for the screw eye to kind of sit in there. And then I'll just take a drill bit, or in this case, because the resin is soft enough, with the micro balloon distortion, I can just get the stainless steel rod I have and polish up the end and use it as an actual drill bit because finding a drill bit small enough to hold the rod, but still long enough to go through a bait like this is very challenging. Okay, so that's how we joined it the first part. We're gonna be joining the other two pieces pretty much the same way. If you're going to remold this as a final master, you would have to do a two-piece mold in order to pull those concave bevels out. You cannot do it in a one-piece mold, you'll have distortions. Or you can just do a one-piece mold and constantly hone them out with the Dremel. Either way works. When these slipping or turning too much, you can always just super glue, put, put a dab of super glue before you actually screw these in and they'll stay pretty tight. <laughs> All right, one last piece, and I already honed that stupid piece out, so I don't have to deal with this. So we're gonna go ahead and just take care of that right now. Some of these aren't standing still because I could not find, my search engine powers are only so good. So if anybody knows where you can find like multiple size screw rides, just not the, not the super small ones, the super big ones like I have, like the medium sized ones like this, I think they're pretty invaluable for at least how we're doing it. looking actually pretty darn good i will say like it for just like a you know a crackpot garage bait i really like the way it came out i really like its shape i know like these are things that we can fix and then remold the way we fix and remold the actual gizzard template itself but i'm pretty i'm pretty happy about this i'm gonna use this as a four jointed kind of you know i never made a four jointed bait ever before i'm not really even sure the tail should be like that i vote the three jointed base that i made i always give the, give the tail loose and have one there. I've got a lot of really good success. In fact, caught some of my biggest fish off of that way, but those were those were diving. This one doesn't suspend. So what I, I've had not the greatest luck on making crank downs that don't end up having a super, super slow suspend. So I'm not going to use a crank down. I'm actually gonna use this as maybe more of a trolling. I think this will look really, really good in the water trolling at a higher speed. I know they, they fish the bull shed that way where it, it's, it's actually a pretty high speed. You know, there's a million other scenarios where I think I could run this and it could be good. I just don't have a bait that does what this one probably can do and will do. This is also probably a lot heavier. Probably now it'll sink. Nope, it still floats. SOB. It does sink with the four out hooks. And so what we'll do is we'll find God, somewhere in here, there's some Kevlar and we'll make some Kevlar hooks for it. It really does not weigh jack doggy crap. Like I think this bait weighs more than that thing. I swear, a six super light. I really want to make this a glide. I kind of just by screwing around with this one figured out the, the algorithm to make a glide. So I'm thinking about it real bad right now. Super thinking about casting one and then making one and then just mess, just having fun with these. 
And just for a demonstration, I casted another raw mold. And now I'm going to put scales on this one. This one I would try to go for just some experiment stuff. If I get it right, I get it right. If I don't, I'll just recast another one. Not a big deal. But trying different scale patterns. The scales on the Gizzard Shad are super, like, tedious. You'd have to... I'm trying to figure out a way to cross hatch them um, all in a pencil marking to where it will actually work. We'll try one side with these scales, the other side with another series of scales. We'll just kind of mess around and see what we can do. But the whole thing about this is that it is now carvable because it is a softer resin because we distorted the mass. I'm using random wood chisels that I found on Amazon. And I even found a kit of these at Harbor Freights. I didn't know Harbor Freight sold wood chisels, but they do. And you can also find X amount of wood chisels and sculpting tools at Hobby Lobby or Michael's. They're all there. So just have fun and experiment and see what you like. I mean, I'm even kind of liking this whole two-tone thing because I know it would like drive OCD people mad. All right, fast forward. I finished them. I mean, these are the test run versions and hopefully they work well. They, I mean, they should work well. They actually look really good. I can already imagine kind of how it's going to swim just by looking at it. I started polishing up a, a finished replica. I kind of got carried away, but I really want to try these two. I was able to weigh the glide correctly, weighed it perfect, like perfectly to where it's perfectly balanced and it has a really slow fall. I'm very excited to see how that thing will do. I think I got it tuned right about right. Super, super slow scene. It always stays on the top pretty much. The one thing very cool I will tell you is if you make a bait that's really good and it catches fish and it catches big fish, everybody is like, what did you catch it on? You'd be like, I caught it on this bait. And they'd be like, where can I get it? You could be like, you can't. Not unless you want to hook them up. But really, if you have a fire bait that nobody else can blow out and take your spot and blow it out, and it really is kind of worth making. And you don't have to deal with independent volatile garage bait makers who are pricks. For just guessing, the swim bait doesn't swim too terribly bad. I mean, you'd have to slow work it, but ultimately it doesn't do exactly what it needs to do. And it can though, I think it has definite potential, just the weight needs to be redistributed correctly. Too much weight in the front and in the back where I, I tweaked it to balance it out. And that's why it's pitching so much. And then if it's too front heavy, it'll start to roll. If it's too back heavy, it'll start to slide, etc. All right, the prototypes, I'm fairly satisfied. There's some very good things and some very like disappointing things. One is just maybe my own not great judgment in how this thing would swim. Cause I actually had it pretty good before where I could weight them. But again, the body shape of a naturally occurring animal in the wild versus some symmetrically, you know, triangular two piece deal that we try to replicate as a body like this. They just don't swim the same. So this thing definitely does have its own unique deal. When it was gliding, the, the whole thing is it does glide. And if it can get weighted, it's probably going to have a really nice, deep, very natural glide. But when I was gliding, it was doing this number. And that means that it's weighted too far up in the front and then too far back. I actually placed a, a weight back here to balance it out so it would not nosedive, even though it kind of still did a little bit. I even put a weight back in here to balance out even more once it got in the water. Because I tested it with four uh, VMC hooks and then I put these on instead. And these are actually lighter. So then it messed up with the weight because it did initially sink and then it didn't. So I was kind of mad about that. So so who knows what it would have done with the other hooks. I also think these are maybe, I need to re retrace these on, on a different mold and put these a little farther back. This needs to be here and this needs to be closer to the head. Because when I did throw it, um, I did get hits. I didn't get any hookups, which is very surprising. I did get less rats. As the rats would blow up around it, they wouldn't actually go for it. And then uh, there's a few really, really big strippers out there that got underneath it and looked. It, uh, but because it didn't swim right, because at that point in time when you're kind of open gliding it wide, you can attract the fish, but it needs to be able to, to dart and do a really erratic like, like, oh, it just spotted the predator fish. So the fish is like, oh, I'm busted. And then it either goes for it or not. And I couldn't do it. What it did do really well was sit straight. It didn't do this awkward bend. It like, it suspended straight and it suspended. So I was like, hit it on the suspend, hit it on the suspend, hit it on the suspend. And it wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. 
This one just swam great, but I mean, you really need to throw this in shallow water during the day. Um, and then this one would probably have done really well. Um, I still think maybe the, the hook places, I just don't think the front hook is close enough to the head because they're always going to go for the head, the head shot. So this could go right there. And this one, I don't know. Maybe if I just move the hook, the head hook up and leave the back one where it is, it might be better. I don't particularly like the head placement. I place it a little bit long. That way it wouldn't, these, these kind of tend to swing everywhere and grab the line. So I place them a little bit back, but the, the whole point is they go way back underneath the belly. The fish don't attack the belly. Like they attack the head. So when they, you, it's too easy for you to miss the head unless it's just a big fish, like a big 10 pounder that gulps it. And then in which case it doesn't matter, but even, even the bigger baits you kind of, I just swear just one, maybe, yeah, about three or four centimeters up, about a half inch up. We'll see. I mean, we're definitely going to redo this. And I was just, you know, I was messing around with the scale patterns. But I wouldn't mind just... I do I do definitely eventually have to re redo this. This was just very, very loosely done and very loosely polished up just to have a, a running mold so I could do this video. But I'm very, very happy. It would have been really hard for me to ever replicate something like this just simply by looking at pictures on Google, which is what I normally did. And then even like some of the really, really pristinely carved and templated out or 3D molded out... Uh, versions of baits don't even look like this. Just very interesting to see what the actual gizzard shad looks like to get my hands on an actual, you know, nine inch or so gizzard. And so I want to thank you guys. I hope this was very insightful to you on how you would go about making any swim bait, let alone molding a live fish to do it. And then reckon how you would reconstruct that if the fish would, if the mold didn't come out quite right. What I like about these is, yeah, it was molded by a, uh, you know, the live shad was the mold base for the body, but the actual carving and restructuring and stuff gives me its own unique artistic feel to the bait. So where, guys, you've seen some, like a few other ones where they perfectly mold like a dead fish, a dead trout, a dead gizzard. They perfectly mold it. And then when they mold it, it looks like a dead fish. It looks all shrunken and depleted and not quite right. Not quite like a living shad. Like, like it looks, I don't know, fish are kind of... Fish aren't as stupid as you really think. They are, they're just, you know, and there's no shade against them. I'm saying, cause that's just how they make their baits. It, it comes out like a perfectly molded fish, but the fish inside was dead. And I mean, a, a dead, not live fish looks honestly a little bit different when you mold it and you put it out the right and then you try to paint it naturally. Kind of, kind of doesn't, um, doesn't look like quite like how you would think. So maybe the, the little bit of stuff that we put on here in conjunction with how it looks, it looks a little bit more natural and then obviously the tail I, you missed the part i missed the part i didn't i didn't record it but i fattened up the tail so i could split a joint like that and i did a few other things like you know the hook anchors and a, a few other things that were not consistent with the fish but the forehead creasing the actual gizzard gullet the actual the scale pattern all those things which when i do put out and remold my final version which i would say you know a a version three of this, um, that one will look really nice and pristine and a little bit more artificial, but it will be, it'll be pretty awesome. But for right now, the raw mold, the raw mold is, as long as I can cut this right and weight it right, I think the glide's gonna produce a lot of serious quality fish. It'll produce the best quality fish. I mean, finally a bait that's big enough to chase the rats away. Cause I was getting absolutely smashed on my, uh, on my eight and nine inch. And I threw a nine inch. I was like, the rats ain't gonna hit this. And for sure crap, the rats will hit it. They'll do it. They ain't afraid of nothing out here. All right, guys, thank you much for this video. I hope this helped you out.